and they put on top of this whole man that was on top of the lame man, they put the skin of Rabbi Yishmoel. And they dressed him in the clothing of Odom Arishan. They had the clothing of Odom Arishan, first man, they dressed him in those clothing. And they paraded him through the street and said, this is, what, this is what happens to the brother of our master who is a fraud. This is what is done to the brother of our master who is a fraud. Our master is Esau. The, the lame man represented Yaakov. As we just said, he limped. The whole man represents Esau. And the lame man carries the whole man on his shoulders through the streets of Rome. Once in 70 years, because the first base of Mikdash, the first temple was destroyed. After it was destroyed, 70 years later, the second base of Mikdash was built. They're trying to say, the Romans are trying to say with this parade, look, 70 years have elapsed, and the Jews have not recovered. This shows that our victory is complete. The Jews will never find a salvation. They did it every 70 years to prove that they have performed the greatest benefit for mankind. Israel kapta, the Jews will never revive themselves. So the lame man represented Yaakov, Ovinu, and he carries the whole man on his shoulders. Esau, as if to say, the real, the real leader of the world, the ruler of the world, the one whose ideas are really permanent, powerful, lasting in this world is Esau's ideas. Look, the lame man, Yaakov Avinu, is carrying him on his shoulders. And they dressed the whole man, they dressed Esau in the clothing of Odom Arishan. Odom Arishan dressed themselves in clothing after he did the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge. Eitz Adas. Odom Arishan had clothing. That meant the clothing represented, this is what man really should be like. Whom should man be like? Esau. Esau is the ideal man. And Yaakov Avinu was limping. Doesn't say what clothing he was wearing. Some kind of degraded clothing probably. He's carrying Esau on his shoulders, wearing the clothing of Adam Arishan. This is what man is. I had a parenthetical statement which is a personal opinion. If you ask anyone, what's the purpose of university? Any university? The answer will be, is to study man. As a matter of fact, I think it's on the, on the uh, logo of many universities, the idea that man is the purpose of knowledge. That's Esau's view, of, that's Esau's worldview. Everything is for man, everything is to enhance man, to make him better, make him wealthier, to be able to conquer nature, able to make new inventions, to be able to build buildings and roads and highways and satellites and Computers, all for men, so man can have greater enjoyment and greater wealth. No university ever says that they're interested in man coming closer to God. Only yeshiva does that. The yeshiva and the university, their philosophies are Jerusalem and Athens. All the universities have Athenic architecture. You notice the Jewish yeshivas don't have practically any architecture. But that's a, because everything is inside. Everything is inner, everything is in the soul, not external. The struggle of the culture around us, the culture around us is the culture of Esau. If there's, any, if there's any attempt to incorporate religion into the culture, it's never as a goal of mankind, but because religion makes you happier, makes you more satisfied, it builds your family, makes you more relaxed, you live longer, get along better with your wife. It's all selfish reasons. They're all true, but the selfish reasons. But that life is for serving God. That's the revolutionary concept of the Jews, of Yaakov Avinu. Life is here to serve God. And the rest is peripheral. And Esau is that life is here to serve men. Esau, Athens, all of it. That's a struggle in history. In fact, I, this professor in Chicago said this in his book. Athens and Jerusalem. That's the struggle of mankind. Well, there's one part of mankind that struggles for Jerusalem, for spiritual matters. And there's one part of mankind that struggles for physical, material matters. So this parade... They dressed this whole man who's on top in the clothing of Adam and say, this is man. This is what man is all about. That lame Jew down below, he's nothing but a servant. But this idea that man is everything. And then they took the skin of Rabbi Shmuel and put it on his head. And she said, what is that skin of Rabbi Shmuel? 
It's alluded to in the Kinyas that we said today. Rabbi Shmuel was a Kayan God. High priest, the holiest person in the Jewish people. He was the one person who was permitted to go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. He was the holiest man going into the holiest spot on earth, the Holy of Holies, on the holiest day of the year. So we combine the holiness of a man, the holiness of space, the holiness of time, all together, all three together. And this great man, this holiest person of the Jewish people, was murdered by the Romans because he taught Torah to the Jewish people. One of the ten, Ahuge Malchus, one of the ten martyrs killed by the Roman Empire that we mentioned in our Kinnis today, Arze Elevonai, the heart-rending Kinnis that we read about the ten, the ten Ahuge Malchus, the ten martyrs of the Jewish people. And there we have the story of Rabbi Shmuel. That Rabbi Shmuel was about to be killed. The daughter of the emperor saw him. And she realized that she had never seen anything so beautiful like Rabbi Shmuel. The beauty of a man who had entered the Holy of Holies on the holiest day of the year and whose, whose thoughts were constantly involved with Hashem, God, and Torah. A beauty radiated from his face. And she begged her father, don't kill him. There's nothing like that beauty that exists in this world. It's a crime to destroy that beauty. The emperor said, no, I'm sorry. The decree has been made and he has to be killed. So she said, at least, Father, I ask you one thing. Skin him so I'll be able to preserve his skin. But you have to do it alive or else he won't catch the freshness of that skin. Yeah. So the father said, okay, I'll do that for you, my dear daughter. I must accede to your beautiful aesthetic sense We you realize something's exceedingly beautiful when you see it. And they skinned him alive. And Bishmael didn't utter a word while they were skinning him. He was exhaled, he accepted the decree of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But when they came to the place of his film, when they took off the part where he would no longer be able to put on the film and to declare that he believes Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echod, when they, when they skinned that part of his body, he gave out an enormous scream of pain. And then he died. And that skin was preserved by the daughter of the emperor. And it still exists, the sages say, in Rome for all our, all well, we know, maybe it's in the, somewhere in the Vatican, in their museums, their hidden museums, who knows. So they took that, they took that skin, that stuffed skin of Rabbi Shmuel, and put it on top of Esau. Tell us, we are the masters of the beauty of the Jewish people. We have here a definition of the difference between Rome and Jerusalem. What is aesthetics? What are aesthetics? What, do we, what, what makes us, what stirs our soul when we see something beautiful, when we see a sunset or something other beautiful, listen to beautiful music or art or poetry? What stirs our soul? The Jew says what stirs our soul is that we sense with the aesthetic that there's something more to us than the physical. We hear beautiful music, a beautiful symphony playing. Something stirs our soul, we feel, ah, there's more to life than eating hamburgers. There's something spiritual to life. Our souls resonate to the music, which shows that we have a soul. Aesthetics to a Jew is not a goal in itself. The Romans have an expression, art for art's sake. Art for art's sake. That's not a Jewish concept. What does art for art's sake mean? But the goal of aesthetics is to make us feel good. It's like you, paint, you hang a painting on a wall because it makes you feel good. I don't go into why it stirs, schmurs, who cares? The main thing is that I feel good through it. The purpose of aesthetics is to make me have another enjoyment. If we have a symphony orchestra in every city of America, it's because the people want to have some other kind of enjoyment besides eating in restaurants and drinking and going to the football game. They want to have something spiritual in their lives. So they go to the symphony orchestra to be stirred. But it's just the experience of being stirred. It doesn't mean, it doesn't prove to anyone that I have a soul. But it does prove that you have a soul. Why should anyone be stirred by a sunset if it's nothing but an evolutionary accident? He would be stirred by a sunset. What, what, what survival benefit is there in being stirred by, by a sunset? We're stirred by a sunset because we sense that we have a soul, that there's something beyond the physical to the world. There's beauty. There's like we see an expression of something beyond the physical in a sunset or in any work of art. That's the aesthetic sense. To Rome, aesthetic sense is a hamburger, nothing else. It's a more refined form of hamburger. And that was the daughter of the emperor. 
She wanted the skin of Rabbi Shmuel because she could gaze at it and have a pleasure of seeing something ecstatic and beautiful. To us, beauty is a, is a resonation of the soul. And if it doesn't have that, then there's no point in beauty. We believe very much in beauty, but we will make museums where we just go in and be edified and enjoy ourselves. Beauty has to, have, has to be an expression of the spiritual in the person, different attitude. So this skin of Rabbi Shmuel, which is put on the top of that whole man who dressed in the clothing of Adam, meant to symbolize the victory, the triumph of Esau over Yishmuel. The skin was there to say, beauty is nothing more than a human pleasure, nothing to do with the spirit. We've conquered the sense of aesthetics also. All aesthetics are useful for, are to give us another thrill, another type of pleasure. It doesn't mean anything. Man is not a spiritual being. There's this man who claimed that. Look at him, dragging the whole man on his shoulders through the streets. Who's right? We're right. That was the parade. There's a kine that we say today. She has expression. A certain aspect of this idea. If it, I'll translate. The heart mourns and there's no comforting. And my pain over this is greater than any other pain. On well, the son and daughter of Rabbi Shmuel Kohengor, the son and daughter of Rabbi Shmuel Kohengor, this man whose skin was peeled, had a son and a daughter. Their memory burns in my heart. Well, they were captured by the Romans and fell into the hands of two masters. And they were neighbors who lived next door to each other. And they spoke to each other. Oh, this is in poetry. They told each other, each other the stories of their, of their conquests over the Jewish people in Israel. One says, one said, I just came back from, from the booty I took from the Jews. And I captured a servant, a slave woman, dressed in beautiful clothing, whose face has the glow of the moon and whose shape is like the most beautiful women in history, daughters of Eve. That's what one said. The other said, his neighbor said, I just came also from the booty of Jerusalem. I captured a slave, a man slave, beautiful eyes, who shines like the sun in its strength at noon, and the moon when it's full. Come, let's put them together, have them in one room, and we'll share the children that are born from them They'll be the most beautiful children in history. And to hear this, ears echo, and I tear my clothing. As they agreed on this both together that night, they put them together in a single room. And the masters waited outside. But they, the slave, the male slave, the woman slave, cried in bitter tears. Till the morning, their tears did not stop. One, the man who was the son of Rabbi Shmuel said, with a burning heart which melted from pain, a descendant of Aaron Akayin, how could I marry a slave? And she also cried with pain that didn't stop. The daughter of Yocheved, also the daughter of Akayin, how could I marry a slave? For this pain, the stars have to cry. Or Boiker in the morning says, Akikil, when they saw each other who they were. Hoi och, hoi och, hoi si biu. They fell on each other's shoulders and cried, oh, dear brother, dear sister. And they cried and cried until both of them died. For this, Yimyo cries, Abenu bas, Rabban Himo. Yimyo mentions this, the son and the daughter. He refers to the son and the daughter of Yishmael, Koyim Godel. That's, that's what we cry about when you're on Tisha That's the 24th kina of what we say every morning, every day, every year on Tisha This represents Again, the difference between Yishmael, between Yerushalayim and Rome. To Rome, the relation between a man and woman is for profit. Can I get pleasure? Can I get children that I'll be able to sell as a slave? The beauty is nothing but a commercial entity. Something that I can sell. The beauty of the children of Yishmael, the brother and the sister. Something that they can sell.
And the children of Yishmael and Rabbi Yishmael had a different view of what the male-female relationship is. It's to carry on the tradition, carry on another generation of the Jewish people. The son, how could the son, a descendant of Avon Akayin, marry a slave woman? And she, how could she, she a descendant of Yecheved, how could she marry a slave? It won't carry on the tradition of the Jewish people. Sex to Goyim, to Rome, is a tool. A tool for selfishness, a tool for pleasure, a tool for profit. But to a Jew, it's a means of continuing the Jewish people. It's a means, it's a means of creating love between men and women and family and children. That's what, that's what it's for. Because life is with a purpose. Life is for a way, is, life is here to serve God, nothing else. Here we have not only Rabbi Shmuel himself symbolizing the difference between Rome and Jerusalem, but his children symbolizing that difference. Hoi och, hoi och hois. And they cried on each other's shoulders until they died. I have to go back to Yemiyo's answer. Yemiyo said to Plato, your other question, your second, the other question, where you asked, why should I mourn stones and wood? You won't understand because you're not Jewish. Why? Because we mourn, because I'm mourning is the way we get back to building the base of Mikdash. We don't mourn out of sentimentality. We don't mourn, make museums and, talk, and cluck our tongues and say, ah, oh, we once had it so great. We don't make pictures of the shtetl and say we were once nice or look, look for our history to make us feel secure. Historical, with a beautiful history. That's not why we mourn. We mourn because the mourning is how we create our future. The morning builds the future of Eis Whoever is misabal in Yerushalayim, whoever mourns on Yerushalayim, whoever can cry over the brother and sister, whoever can cry over the skin of Rabbi Shmuel, whoever can cry over the Chum Beis Amikdosh, is building the Beis Amikdosh. Because we were overcome by Rome because we subordinated ourselves to Rome. Rome didn't, like Nefesh Haim says, when, they, when the Romans went into the base of Mikdosh and destroyed it, burnt it, Chazal said, Kamcho Trino Tachnos. You're grinding up, ground up flour. It's already ground up. It's already destroyed. It was destroyed in heaven. The physical base of Mikdosh is just an expression of what happens in the souls of the Jewish people. The souls of the Jewish people became subordinate to Rome's philosophy. They wanted to live by Rome's philosophy. The base of Mikdosh is just an external manifestation of their souls. So you're grinding up, ground up flour. It was already destroyed. And the Nefesh says also that when a person brings a wrong thought into his mind, he's, he's doing worse than Titus did by bringing whatever he did into the Beis HaMikdosh. Because we are the Beis HaMikdosh. The collective Jewish soul is the Beis HaMikdosh. And when we permit Rome to overcome our inner Beis HaMikdosh, the outer Beis HaMikdosh crumbles and turns into dust. So we are really Mourning to rebuild the Beis Hamikdash. We're mourning to change our attitude. We don't want to be Romans. We want to be Jews. We don't want to live in Rome. We want to live in Jerusalem. We don't want to serve man. We want to serve God. We feel pain that the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. Because when the Beis Hamikdash is destroyed, that means that we are subordinate to Rome in our neshamas, our souls. Now this was the answer Yimyo gave Plato. If you'd be a Jew and you'd know and believe that the Beis HaMikdash will someday they be rebuilt, and we have in our souls that belief, we know that it's going to happen as part of our makeup as Jews. Don't forget, it's over 2,000 years since the destruction of the Temple, and we still sit on the ground and mourn it. What nation does that? What nation has such a, such a, such a sense of reality of something that happened 2,000 years ago? What nation? leaves a corner of the house unadorned. Zechel Mikdosh. What nation breaks a glass at every wedding? Zechel Mikdosh. What, nature, what nation says, What nation is so faithful to the place of Amarovi that when you come there you tear your clothing if you haven't been there 30 days? What nation is so committed to the belief that there will be a rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdosh. 
part of our genes. Can't live without it. Every speech ends with Mashiach coming. Every discussion has the underlying belief that there'll be a Mashiach. Every Jew lives with that belief. That's why he never despairs. He never, he never loses hope. A Jew knows it'll be saved. It's part of our makeup. If you'd be a Jew, my dear Mr. Plato, and have that belief, then you'll understand why we mourn. Because we know we have to get back to that point. We will get back to that point by mourning. That's the purpose of our mourning. Our mourning is to bring home to ourselves with whom we identify. Do we identify with Rome or do we identify with Jerusalem? The mourning is the belief that man is not the goal of life, but man is here to recognize there's a Bible as the creator. If I'll forget Yerushalayim, let my right hand forget its power. Let my tongue stick to its roof, to the roof of the mouth. If I don't mention you, that's part of my life. When we finish the, the kinis, we all stand up and say, Ali, Tzioyim, Yerecho, Kmo Yishov, Tzirecho. A beautiful tune, a very mournful, and sad tune has been sung for thousands of years. It's even sung in the middle of Musaf. Those Chazonim, they know the right Nusach. When you say, we also be singing with the tune of Elitzi Yom Yerecho. The Chodoidi in many communities is sung with that name, the Shabbos Chazonim, the Shabbos before, before uh, Tishabal. Why do we stand up when we sing that, that tune? All the, all the kinis, we sit down. We get the elitio of Yerel, we stand up. And everyone sings it together. It's the most heart-rending part of the whole kinis. Why do, we sit, why do we sing it standing? Why not sitting like everything else? I once heard, the reason is like this. After finishing the kinis, we want to make a statement that we continue our morning after we get up also. We don't stop with the kinis that we sit while sitting on the ground. The echo of those kinis stays within us while we're getting up, and while we're walking around, and while we're living, while we're doing everything all year, the echo of the kinas that we sang still remains with us. And this idea, the kinas are all about one idea. We mourn the fact that Rome has overpowered us, and still overpowers us. Its culture still overpowers us. Just look around at what the culture is. You'll see it overpowers us. We mourn the loss of the Beis Hamikdosh. We mourn the loss of the skin of Rabbi Shmuel. We mourn the loss of a brother and sister that can die with pain over realizing that they practically were violated a tremendous transgression against humanity. That a Jewish girl should marry a non-Jewish man and that a Jewish man should marry a non-Jewish girl. We mourn all of that. And we mourn it as we walk when we get up. And we continue it. The echoes of the morning, the echoes of the kinnis stay with us all through our lifetimes. Because without that, without that, we're not really Jewish. The Jew mourns and knows that there's more to life than an iPod. There's more to life than 5,000 channels of TV shows coming in on, 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 one, on one computer. There's more to life than that. Life is that we can, be, we can become angels. We can become spiritual beings. Life is that we can come closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's what we're here for. HaKadosh Baruch Hu help us give us the wisdom that we should always, all through the year, be able to maintain the lessons that we study on Tisha B'Av. And to really say with feeling, Yerushalayim, Tishkach Yemini, Tidbak L'shoyni L'chiki, L'loyas G'orechi.